So before we move away from HEMA uh, vigilance mm. and picking up from a discussion that was uh, had before the break about the importance of informing patients and their clinicians about the fact of a blood transfusion, uh, could I take um, Professor Newberger to... Uh, this is after the event, is it? Uh, both before and after. Yeah. Um, if I could take him to a, a few documents, one of which is uh, a document from SABTO, but if we could begin with the um, NICE guidance from 2015. We have RLIT 40947 on screen, please. This was a document that was helpfully exhibited to uh, Professor Bellamy's um, statement. But the, the point is one which I'd like to pick up with Professor Newberger in light of the SABTO guidance. We can see that this is uh, a NICE guideline on blood transfusion published on the 18th of November 2015. Uh, if we could go to page eight of that document, please. The guideline contains the following about patient information. Provide verbal and written information to patients who may have or who have had a transfusion and their family members or carers as appropriate, explaining the reason for the transfusion the risks and benefits, the transfusion process, any transfusion needs specific to them, any alternatives that are available, and how they might reduce their need for a transfusion, uh, that they are no longer eligible to donate blood, <coughs> that they are encouraged to ask questions. Uh, Professor Newberger, um, would you agree that uh, these are important matters to discuss with a patient and important information to be provided both verbally and in writing? Yes, and in a format that's appropriate for the patient, I think is important to add, or that their care is appropriate. Um, having said that, I think one's got to put it in context, because although for a patient having a specific blood test, say because uh, they're undergoing chemotherapy or because they're going to have, uh, 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 um, or for trauma, I, I think where I think it's more difficult is in the context of, say, major surgery, where you've got all the other components to bear in mind. That said, the key elements of giving the patient information, giving them the authority to accept or reject that information is, 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 is crucial. And to know they may receive blood, and if they have that they have received blood is important. But not only patient information, well, we'll come on to other people who should be informed later, perhaps. So there are two elements, well, more than two elements, but among the elements to it are, are this. Firstly, that there is, as you say in your statement, a residual risk to any blood transfusion. Yes. And the patient should be giving informed consent about that risk. Yes, absolutely. And secondly, providing this information will allow a patient, or at least give the first step on that, that chain that we were discussing before the break, of being able to identify, if they subsequently have health problems, that they have had a blood transfusion and that this may be something which should be considered by their clinicians in trying to assess uh, why they have picked up a, a particular health condition. Yes. Um, a document which, which we don't have on the system, but which I will refer to now and is available uh, publicly, is a further NICE document which was published on the 15th of December 2016. And that is a quality statement. Um, it is, uh, sorry, quality standard. It is quality standard 138. Uh, and it, in effect, reiterates um, one aspect of, of what is in that guidance. Um, by saying uh, the quality statement is people who may need or who have had a blood transfusion are given verbal and written information about blood transfusion. So that's prospectively people who may need it or who have had a blood transfusion uh, and that may perhaps capture people who are in major trauma and who aren't able to be informed of it in advance perhaps because they're in a, uh, an unconscious state. Um, if we could then turn to the SABTO uh, document, which you helpfully exhibited to your statement and which you help, helpfully explain um, 
in paragraphs uh, 3.7 and, and following of your statement. This is WITN 7001044. Again, it is a document which is uh, available publicly on the gov.uk website, and it is entitled Guidelines from the Expert Advisory Committee on the Safety of Blood Tissues and Organs on Patient Consent for Blood Transfusion. Uh, it, it is a document which is uh, 20 pages long and, and contains a number of links within it. I, I again, don't mean any disrespect if we, if we just focus on one piece now. Um, if we could turn to page four, electronic page four, please. Uh, and the summary of the recommendations. Uh, you write that we recommend that um, informed and valid consent for transfusion is completed for all patients who will likely or definitely receive a transfusion. Um, then if we go down to the, the next bullet point, patients who have been given a blood transfusion and were not able to give informed and valid consent prior to the transfusion are informed of the transfusion prior to discharge and provided with relevant paper or electronic information. So that is to capture those who were, for example, unconscious. Is that right? Indeed. Then point three, all patients who have received a transfusion have details of the transfusion, brackets, types of component, together with any adverse events associated with the transfusion included in their hospital discharge summary to ensure both the patient and their family doctor are aware. Uh, if we go on to the next um, bullet point, the UK Blood Service provides a standardised source of information for patients who may receive a blood transfusion in the UK. Following page, please, Lawrence. The next bullet point, training in consent for transfusion is included in all relevant undergraduate healthcare practitioners' training. Followed by continuous regular knowledge updates, minimum three yearly, for all healthcare practitioners involved in the consent for transfusion process. Next bullet point there is a centralised UK wide information resource for healthcare practitioners to facilitate consent for transfusion discussions. I won't go through all of the rest of that bullet point, but it is to provide. Uh, information including details about up-to-date details about the risk of transfusions and the final bullet point all UK healthcare organizations who provide blood transfusion employ mechanisms such as audit to monitor the implementation and compliance with these SABTO recommendations mm -hmm. with subsequent improvement plans developed and implemented if indicated um, so those are the main recommendations and is it right that they include a recommendation that uh, the discharge summary, so a, a written document, be it electronically or on paper, contains details of the fact of a blood transfusion and the type of a blood transfusion and any adverse events associated with it. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, the reasons I think are fairly self-evident why we felt that's important. Um, th there is therefore a formal record that they have received a transfusion, the GP and anybody else looking at their discharge summary will be aware, and hopefully it'll be a permanent record. Um, and even if the patient forgets, which is not unlikely given a complex clinical journey, um, healthcare professionals can access that, and th there is something clearly in the notes. If we take a hypothetical example of somebody who is brought into hospital unconscious following a car accident, and then spends six weeks, eight weeks, primarily on an orthopaedic unit because of difficulties with his or her legs or arms or something like that. Uh, the fact that they have had a transfusion right at the start, which they weren't able to give consent for because they were unconscious, unconscious is recorded in the discharge summary for the patient and the GP and anybody else to see in, in later, later time. Yes, and, and then hopefully the patient would have been informed once they regained consciousness and were able to take on that information. Um, can I then bring up a... Uh, uh, sorry, before we leave the, the SABTO guidance, who is this guidance 
directed to? Who receives it and what do you expect them to do with it? I, I, I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> um, we have either the benefit, uh, the problem or the luxury of uh, not being an executive organisation. Um, so we make these recommendations. We did this because it's knowing it's likely outside our remit as, as, as an independent committee, <coughs> but we felt it was so important to stress these points, and we did follow it up with a publication in uh, clinical medicine, which goes out to many, um, particularly physicians, uh, junior and senior. Um, but this was for the general um, professional bodies, for individual doctors, but it has no statutory authority in the sense it comes from NH the NHS, it comes from the Royal College, but it does come, we believe, from a professional body, which therefore, and, and it largely reiterates what NICE has said, but we felt it was important to stress these issues which were of concern to us, enable us to get not only well-informed patients, which is important, but also to knowledge of potential risks so that we could understand hemovigilance better. If I can take you then to um, a document which you were provided with over the break, and we're grateful to all three of you for looking at it. Um, it's WITN 7310002, page five of that document, please. Now, this is going back to the nice quality standard mm. uh, that I referred to earlier, quality standard 138 for 2016 publication. Uh, it is a, um, a part of the national comparative audit that was performed, and it is uh, sent to a, a particular university uh, trust. Um, if we could go down to quality statement four, please, which is the one that I read to you earlier. Now, this document puts that quality statement in a slightly different way, and I, I, I'm not sure why it does so. And the, the wording here may be a, a, a little uh, misleading. So with that note of caution, it says quality statement four. People who have had a transfusion are given verbal and written information about blood transfusion. Um, the reason that I flag the wording is because uh, the actual wording of the quality standard is slightly different. Um, which is people who may need or who have had a blood transfusion are given a verbal and written are given verbal and written information about blood transfusion. So those prospectively as well as retrospectively. Whereas this wording seems to only apply retrospectively, and I, I, I have to say I, I don't know why there is that difference. But having flagged it, I think there is a, a wider point which is perhaps uh, can be made on, on this information that um, the audit results for that site indicate zero percent compliance uh, with the provision of both verbal and written information. Uh, regional compliance is said to be 9%, and national compliance is said to be 26%. Now, this is based on an audit, and it requires the data which is gathered locally to be assessed in order to, to make that audit. So these aren't figures which are definitive by any stretch. But can I ask for your reflections on what you take from those figures? I mean, given all... I think, I think disappointing is probably maybe an understatement. Um, not necessarily unsurprising, but disappointing. Um, and how, you know, whether they're precise is immaterial, really. Um, they're low and unacceptably low, I would say. Uh, this is 2021, NICE guidance 2015, quality statement 2016, SABTO guidance 2020. Uh, and this audit 2021, that's uh, the chronology. I, I, I mean, it, it is a real challenge to get standards into practice, whether it's for blood safety or, or anything else. 
Um, people are working at it, but clearly there's a long way to go. Um, it's not SABTO's, within SABTO's remit to address these issues. Um, we can draw attention to them and we do work closely with the blood services, NHSBT and MHRA and others. Um, so they're aware and we're contributing hopefully to solve the problem. But essentially, it, it's not within our remit to take forward, um, but we know that others are and that's, it sounds a bit weak, but that's the best we can do for uh, SAPTO. Uh, the, the, the worrying thing, obviously, is that when each of you were, were discussing just before lunch uh, the, the the weaknesses in the in the system, which essentially uh, uh, you identified the awareness of somebody in the first place that they had a transaction, which may not always be the case, that they recognised that what they had to uh, in terms of health consequence. This is the the latent condition that you, uh, Dr. Cave, were particularly uh, concerned about. That, that might, they didn't necessarily link the two. Mm. Uh, and that then links into what Professor Bellamy was saying uh, the whole system depends upon what people, i.e., the clinicians, choose to, uh, first of all, report. Um, when they, what they choose to report of what they could report, uh, and when they have the ability to report. So all of this starts with the patient awareness in at least in the case of latent transfusion, that they've had a transfusion uh, and that there may be consequences. Absolutely, and, and that's why we stepped out, if you like, of our remit to emphasise that point, that informing the patient and having an informed patient is key or a major key to helping pharmacovigilance improve. Is there anything that can be done to improve uh, the, uh, the starting point, the patient's awareness, A, of having a transfusion, and B, that whatever condition they may later have could be a consequence if it's uh, something which is they haven't faced before or, or is otherwise unexplained to them. I think... Patients are provided with a vast amount of information. And I think one has to be selective in what information is given with consent under the new, the new guidance. One has to give patients an awful lot of information, as, 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 as you will be aware. And I think sometimes we're not good at differentiating the important ones and the less important ones for us, never mind for the patient. Um, and I think how we present information to patients, it varies so much between patients. Some want a lot more, some want it in graphics, some in statements, different types of statements. I think there's a whole piece of work to how you present complex information to patients in a way they can understand and take home because often in consultations, whether it's particularly before, from my experience, say before transplant, they're so stressed because of their health conditions and effect of medication and uncertainty of the future and all these other things that they don't really, they're not in a position to take in information. Involving carers and families is important. Um, but I think the whole, it's very important, obviously, for the blood, but that has to be in the context of the other information, and that will vary. I think we're not very good at it, um, and I'd like to say, hold you more work as to how you present information to patients as individuals in a format that they want and they can understand both at the time and in retrospect, so that you know when the procedure is over, they've got over their operation, they can then go back and read and if necessary, come back and ask questions. Could I ask, firstly, Dr. Cave and subsequently Professor Bellamy for their reflections on the discussion that we've just had with, with Professor Newberger? 
Yes, I mean, I would, for, for, our, for, for an, an, a licensed product as such, so the MHA responsibility and remit within blood and blood components lies obviously with the BSQRs and the, the, the donor, the collection, the distribution. So our responsibility ends there because it's not indicated for a particular uh, disease. I would just say more generally, we put a lot of effort for authorised products into our patient information leaflets so that patients are informed and they understand about the benefits and risks of a product that they are taking. Um, in for some circumstances, we have additional risk minimisation measures where there may be particular difficult issues that we need to inform patients of. So I could only <coughs> agree and endorse the view that patients should be, should be provided with this information because then it will allow them to be aware should they suffer any adverse response at a later date. Thank you. Professor Bellamy. I think Dr. Uh, Professor Newberger's points are very well made is in that patients prior to a procedure, prior to a course of treatment, potentially <clears throat> are bombarded with information such that it's difficult to see the wood for the trees. And the information which may be important to somebody before their operation, probably the bits and pieces they're most worried about or the bits and pieces which are most likely to happen. Then the procedure happens. And after the procedure, you're then in a situation where only some of those things have happened and therefore they become the important ones. So although it may be valuable to present a lot of information or make a lot of information available to somebody before a procedure, I think it would actually be quite useful after a procedure to select out those bits that had actually happened and then send that person away with a little checklist of these are the things that actually happened. Uh, you had a hip replacement, but two days later that hip dislocated. Web link, hip replacement and dislocation, these are the problems to watch out for in the future. You had a blood transfusion. Most of our patients don't get a blood transfusion, you did, therefore you may wish to reread the following bits. Now, you could do that in practical terms, you could do that in several ways. It could be done in a simple physical way, the one bit of a, patient, a patient's um, journey which is absolutely standard through all hospitals at all times is the wristband with their identifiers on. So you could put on a second wristband, a green one, which says you have had a blood transfusion. Red is already used for allergy. You could do that electronically. As part of the discharge summary, the discharging doctor could simply have a tick box electronic solution and then the computer prints out or emails to the patient a little list of web links of you had a blood transfusion, you had drug X, whatever that happens to be, uh, and an allergic reaction. Here's something further about drug X and allergic reactions. Here's something further about blood transfusion. That would be a relatively easy solution to implement, and it, it would be an approach which saves people, people from being bombarded with vast amounts of information that they don't subsequently recall. Thank you. Um, moving on to a related theme, um, which both Professor Bellamy and, and Professor Newberg were asked about in their uh, Rule 9 letters, um, which is the, the merits or otherwise of a transfusion database recording all instances where blood or blood products are transfused to a patient. Uh, now, this is a, as I say, slightly different from, from patient information. This is collecting centrally that kind of information of, of where blood or blood products have been used. Um, could I begin with you, Professor Bellamy? Um, what are your thoughts about the, the merits and demerits of such a database? I think if it could be deliverable within the NHS as we know it, it would be a very major step forward. Um, hugely useful, both for um, helping protect individual patients, for helping spot problems, um, complications early, and pick up patterns early, and for making sure that the information we've got is actually reasonably accurate as regards dates, and timelines and, um, and, and, and bi-directional traceability and so on. It is also something that it would be possible for 
in principle, the GP to access, so they would then know that their patient had received a transfusion, and for the patient to ask their GP, did I have a transfusion, what did I get, what are the implications of that, and get a little printout to say, yeah, that's what you got. Those are the implications. So there are huge public safety um, benefits to it. There are audit and research benefits to it. There are individual patient benefits to it. Whether or not, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not an IT expert, I'm just an IT fan. Um, you would have to ask an IT expert about how to deliver it. Uh, Professor Newberger, if I could uh, touch you, not necessarily as an IT expert, um, <laughs> although I'm very happy uh, to, to be corrected on that, uh, but um, what, what are your thoughts about a national database? I, I, I think, I, I don't think it would do any harm. I think it, if it were well integrated into the NHS system, I think we have too many standalone systems mm. as it is, mm. and I think integration is, is, is important. The other point I would just make in addition to Professor Bellamy's points, with which I agree, is that ideally it should be UK-wide. Patients move around between the four nations. The blood services at the moment are independent. Um, and <coughs> if it's going to be a comprehensive database, as I hope it would be, then to make it reflecting what people do with their lives rather than the politics, I think would be preferable, but whether that's politically achievable is another matter. Uh, Professor Cave, if I could turn to you on, on this topic. I think the principle sounds very useful. I think if we could go with the principle of collect once, use often, so rather than duplicate other reporting systems be integrated in some way, um, it would be useful if it could be used to track batches um, and for traceability, help with root cause analysis. I think it would also be ideal if it could be linked to outcomes um, to help with those longer term outcomes. It would need to include patient identifiers, you know, anonymized suitably, but so that you could track back to outcomes through to the primary record, which I kind of think is what you're indicating, or allow the GP to search it to identify a specific individual. Uh, and sorry, if I can also just supplement that. I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree, but if, for example, you have a patient who you think has had a transfusion transmitted infection, you can go back to that donor mm. and look at their other re the recipients of their mm. other products or their other donations, and that, again, would facilitate better patient care because not only transparency in informing the patient, but often therapeutic interventions that would improve the quality and length of their life. So that would be another major benefit of a centralised system. So you have complete traceability down to the individual. And as you say, to be able to link, for example, with a hepatitis B database or a you know, hepatitis F or G or whatever is the next one to be identified, uh, 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 um, it, it would facilitate improved not only hemovigilance, but patient care. Dr. Cave, would that go some way to helping to provide those large data sets that you spoke about in terms of pharmacovigilance, which are more achievable in pharmacovigilance? Yes, I mean, definitely. Um, we can't always link to a long-term outcome, um, and that's why we often go to the large electronic health record databases the more data they have, the more you can understand what are the confounders, what are the biases, what is the control population, the incident of whatever you're looking at in the control population to understand is the observe rate we're seeing more than we would expect to see under normal circumstances. And those sort of comparators are very useful in trying to understand whether there's a causality in the event that you're looking at. The the answer that um, Professor Bellamy gave at the start was prefaced with the words, but if this were achievable mm -hmm. uh, in the NHS as we know it, uh, drawing on your experience, are you able to say how achievable this might be? Is, is it a realistic aspiration? I, I, I would, I think it will be, well, I would imagine it would be complex to link across all hospital trusts, but you would have to have a, a standalone system that somehow 
extracted information from hospital systems and then collated them into a central database. I, I wouldn't like to be able, I wouldn't be able to comment on the feasibility of it. I guess anything is feasible yes. if you had sufficient resources. Uh, Professor Bellamy, just, just to conclude with you, um, in your statement at paragraph 60, you said that um, you consider this to be a, a reasonable near future aspiration, but to make it happen would require significant political will, investment, cultural change and acceptance. Um, political will and investment, I think we can all understand what you meant by that. Uh, what about cultural change and acceptance? What were you getting at there? Well... One of the, not the only barrier, but one of the barriers to um, electronic patient records um, has, has been concerns about data security and people's related concerns um, <coughs> about their, their privacy, as a result of which not certainly in the early days, less so now, a lot of people haven't opted in to electronic records, even where GPs have offered these. So that needs some cultural change, which would have to be a national cultural change, not just an NHS cultural change. The cultural change within the NHS um, would have to be one about people sharpening up their acts to make sure that they did actually record transfusion data properly and uh, contemporaneously. Um, can I just turn to the panel and see if there's anything else that they would like to add on the possibility of a national database? And if not, I will move on. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cave, um, if I could turn to pharmacovigilance. Now, I'm going to tread on this very, very lightly indeed uh, in light of Dr. Rain's evidence on Monday. Okay. Um, but just to give a uh, a very quick overview, and it's very helpfully set out in your statement, which uh, will be published online and people will be able to, to read it there as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, as you have said earlier, there is a different set of legislative requirements mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. uh, come from the Human Medicine Regulations of 2012. Mm -hmm. um, there is a system of market authorization, what used to yep. be called product licensing, there is a system of pharmacovigilance through the yellow card system, mm -hmm. uh, which is augmented by the black triangle system for mm -hmm. new medicines, uh, as well as reports from patients and from doctors. There is a mandatory requirement for industry to report. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rain also said that there is scouring of, of published literature. Yep. Um, presumably also coroner's Regulation 28 reports will be considered by the MHRA. Uh, and then an analysis will be conducted of yellow card reports. Mm -hmm. um, and if necessary, a major safety review can be uh, implemented. Uh, could I just check, the major safety review, which mm -hmm. you refer to at paragraph 7.7 .7 of your statement, is that something that can be implemented for any drug, whether it is a new drug or uh, an existing drug? Yes, indeed, um, it can. If, if we see a major change in the safety that needs to be, um, for a major safety review, needs to be addressed urgently, we can initiate that, and it has very restricted timescales um, around, set around it. Uh, you explain in your statement that there are different units within the MHRA, there's yep. the safety and surveillance unit that monitors yellow cards, mm -hmm. and then the benefit risk evaluation unit, which carries out the assessments. Yep. Uh, and I, I would just like to take you to... Um, Paragraph 4.28 of your statement, Lawrence, it's at uh, WITN 74770001, page 15. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is about the, the types of uh, factors that will be taken into account yeah. um, in benefit risk assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really by, by way of uh, addition to Dr. Rain's evidence on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, what you wrote in the statement is this. Any new safety signal that is considered to potentially impact on the benefit-risk balance would be subject to a benefit-risk assessment that follows this type of approach. Important aspects that are considered as part of a benefit-risk assessment include A. Therapeutic context B. Severity of disease and how expected benefit could influence the acceptability of risks C. How the medicinal product addresses a medical need 
including any unmet medical need. And D, key evidence on the risk, the strength of that evidence for and against causality and prevalence of the events reported. E, the perspective of patients and healthcare professionals. <coughs> Go over to the next page, please. F, uncertainties around the benefits and the risks. G, the public health impact, including clinical significance of the safety issue and the absolute risk. H, how risk management, including labelling or restrictions to use, to, to use, may help to support a favourable benefit risk assessment. And I, the proportionality of regulatory action. Should we understand this to be some of the factors, not all of them in every case, but some of the factors that will be considered in a benefit risk analysis? Yes, I think that's a fairly comprehensive description. Um, I, yeah. I don't really have much to add, really. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I guess I, a range of data sources would be used in order to extract that sort of information, which you alluded to earlier. The um, benefit risk analysis, which mm. is, is carried out, it may be carried out on a, on a new product for which market authorization is sought, but it may also be carried out on a existing product which is being marketed when a new safety signal is raised. Is that right? That, that's right, because the full information about safety of a product or indeed the benefit risk of the product emerges as the use expands, as it becomes more clinically used more widely clinically, um, especially where a particular risk may be very uncommon. It may be 50 in a million or, you know, one in 100,000 or something like that which generally a clinical trial um, is unlikely to identify. That's why it's so critically important that we have this continuous surveillance and continuous monitoring of the risks of a product while in clinical market and uh, while, while, while in clinical practice. I think the other thing to emphasize is of course, a clinical trial is a very controlled environment. Uh, the, the participants of a clinical trial are very carefully monitored. People are excluded from clinical trials if they have certain comorbidities often or they're taking lots of other medications. And so when a product is then used, as we call it often in the real world, but in clinical practice, the, the numbers of people and the types of people who receive that medication are often very different from the people that were originally in the clinical trial. And therefore, it's very important that we collect that information in a continuous way. In addition to rare adverse events, mm. uh, does the same analysis hold for when there are latent adverse events of the type that we've been discussing? Yeah. And as we've talked about today, they are sometimes hard to capture through the spontaneous reporting systems because people may not associate them with the taking of a medication or a medical intervention. That's why we have to use other data sources so in the medical literature, you'll see often cohort studies where people have been followed over time, often as part of a risk minimization measure. If we're particularly worried about an issue at authorization, and you didn't mention risk management plans, but that's a form of proactive pharmacovigilance that we have when at the point of authorization, we might say there's missing information here or we're worried about a risk. And then we might ask a company to do an additional study once the product's on the market. We may ask them to track a particular risk, or we may ask them to, to put in place a registry where we can track patients who are taking the products in a much more proactive way. So, so those are some of the measures that we would use to track a product while on the market. So if I can give you yeah. a hypothetical situation, obviously yeah. drawn from, from matters which are of interest to the inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, were there to be uh, a, a product for which market authorization was sought and potentially granted, yeah. where there was a, a known risk, um, but over time that risk profile changed, mm -hmm. became more apparent that yeah. this risk was eventuating mm -hmm. and indeed was more serious than perhaps mm -hmm. was originally thought. Um, and yet there were still some clinicians who were keen to continue to use the product. Mm. How would that, sit, that set of facts be dealt with by the, the system as it stands today? So we would look very carefully at that risk 
sometimes with medical products, and it may not be the case with this particular product, you can identify a patient population who's particularly at risk um, from that particular adverse event. And, you can, and, and for us, for a product, it may be an individual has a particular genetic predisposition. It may be that there's a particular interaction with another product, or it may be, for example, they're elderly, have reduced renal function, and they're metabolizing the drug less well than a younger person. So we might be able to say, this is a very serious risk, and we have to mitigate it, but there is still potential for this product to be beneficial to pe other people on the market, uh, other people um, who might, might receive it. So it, it's, it's a very careful assessment. How well could we mitigate that risk? Could we restrict a patient population very carefully so they don't receive that product, which allows then people who might benefit from that product and are not at risk of the harm to still be allowed to receive the product. And I mean, a good example is a pregnancy prevention plan. So for example, if a particular product is teratogenic, we would not want a, a woman who was pregnant or who may become pregnant to receive that product, and we would put in place a pregnancy prevention plan to prevent that. But other individuals can still derive benefit from that product, so you wouldn't want to take it off the market. If it proved impossible to mitigate the risk, or the risk was so widespread that there were no suitable risk minimization measures to put in place, or it was impossible to identify a population for, who the risk, for whom the risk was so low that the benefit risk remained positive. At that stage, we would look to suspend or revocate the product. Uh, how would um, the situation where the, the risk profile has changed over time mm. be dealt mm. with? How, firstly, how would it be identified? And secondly, mm. if it was identified, what are the stages of the, of the assessment that would then take place and who would be so, involved in so it? So that signal may arise in, in many ways. So it could be that we receive a report through our yellow card system uh, and we look at those on a a serious report we look at very, very quickly. We follow up where we can, especially in fatal reports. We would follow up um, every fatal report where it was possible to do so. Um, if a risk looks like it is changing, then we would gather as much data as we can. We would do our own individual epidemiological studies. We would then see if it was possible to identify a particular population who, as I said, the benefit risk remains positive. It, it, it is a case of bringing together all of those sources of information and understanding how well we can control that risk. And again, if it becomes impossible to control the risk, then, then we move to removal of a product from the market. But where there is benefit to be derived, we would look to retain it if we felt we could control it. And there, were, of course, we're reliant on the clinical community to follow the regulatory guidelines and only prescribe the product where the risk benefit is positive according to the guidelines. Oh. But it, it, it is a movable feast and we often increasingly impose risk minimization measures as that risk changes. We might change a dose, we might say please don't prescribe with this other medication because we can see there's a drug-drug interaction. We might say don't give to women of childbearing age. There will be increasing measures put in place but ultimately if the risk is too high or it's uncontrollable that would be the point where the product would be removed from the market. When you say we obviously you're talking about the MHRA yes, and yes. ultimately for the MHRA to advise. But we would seek that. independent advice through that procedure and you've asked me in my statement about the Commission on Human Medicines yes. there are independent experts um, who advise us so and they have a number of expert working groups or a number of expert groups that it sit under the Commission of Human Medicines. So every assessment report that I've described would, for that sort of risk, we would always seek independent expert advice on the regulatory measures that we were proposing. The minutes of the Commission on Human Medicines and their, their working groups, as I understand it, are published in a accessible on the, the yes, internet. Yes, the, the, the minutes of the CHM are published. Uh, yes. I think Dame June said on Monday that the 
the full um, benefit risk reports aren't necessarily published, yeah. but in some instances there will be a public an over assessment report. Yeah. So a public assessment. Yes. Uh, in the example that I've just given, where there was a, a concern raised about yeah. a medicine, would you expect a public we assessment would, report I mean, I, um, to be released? My ambition would be to be to release as much of the information as was possible, because I think it helps people understand why we're taking the action that we're taking. We have also a number of other routes. We have something called a drug safety update bulletin, where we communicate with healthcare professionals, and those can be quite comprehensive articles where we set out the measures, the risks, the data that we've looked at, as well as the recommendations of our experts around managing that risk. And that is a monthly bulletin. So that goes out um, to all healthcare professionals in the UK and is freely available on our website. And is it right that as well as informing professionals, it also gives them an opportunity to critique the thinking or the, the um, action? At that point... Suggested? It's the regulatory action is usually being decided. Yes. Okay. Um, we are talking there about pharmacovigilance, so yes. we're talking about blood products. Uh, Professor Neuberger, um, would SABTO have any role in, in that process or not? At the moment, we have no resources or expertise or influence in... Uh, uh, actually managing any form of hemovigilance, we rely on SHOT and it provides, you know, as I said before, a reassurance, if you will, um, that there are no red flags, but that the converse does not apply, that because there are no red flags, there's no safety. Um, if I can just make one important, well, there are several important differences between drug pharma, pharmacovigilance and hemovigilance in that with hemovigilance, we know we start off with impure products. And furthermore, the risks to that, if you like, the input, the blood, is evolving. It's evolving because of greater understanding of infectious agents, because of new infectious agents that are being recognized, um, people's behavior, travel, climate change is bringing new potential infections into the UK, people's traveling and so on. So the risks are constantly changing outside our control. Whereas with a drug, sure, you have a... a, 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 a um, your starting point on the whole, I think, would be fair to say, it's fairly robust and secure, and you're just looking for new uh, events. I think the other thing is that people don't report many adverse drug reactions because they're well-known or established, uh, which is a problem. With blood, I think, and again, this is slightly controversial, we say that blood is very safe, and therefore I think people don't make the assumption there's an illness or infection could be attributed to that blood. And I don't want to cause alarm, but I, I think there is that dichotomy of saying, yes, blood's very safe, but it's not completely safe. And to get that message across so that people retain confidence and will have the treatment they need to save lives, um, subject to their consent, of course, um, is, I think, a difficult balance. And that may be partly why clinicians and patients and carers don't attribute, in fact, don't relate blood. So it's another factor to contend with and another challenge to overcome. But on that challenge, can I put a, a second hypothetical situation to, um, firstly to Professor Bellamy and then to the rest of the panel as well? Uh, and again, hypothetical but drawn from events uh, that are of interest to the inquiry. If you had a, um, a situation where um, evidence emerged of a previously unknown bloodborne virus uh, entering into the, uh, the blood supply within the UK, um, where data and understanding of the virus was initially uncertain, but as time passed, the risks of infection and of the disease 
were increasingly evident. Um, but again, you have resistance to the idea of discontinuing uh, the use of blood or, or blood products um, in some quarters because of a perceived benefit. Um, what, what role would SHOT play and how robust do you think the UK system as a whole is in, in, in dealing with that kind of unknown virus now? That's, a, again, a very interesting question. Um, so the nearest real-world example to that uh, I can pull up for you to describe the processes relates to uh, COVID infection. Now, the, the position SHOT took was we would be very interested if any COVID-related um, <coughs> transfusion, transmitted infections occurred. So, so we were watching out for those. We weren't necessarily expecting to see them, largely for, for two or three reasons. Um, first, because to date there isn't, although it's theoretically possible, there isn't hard evidence um, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is um, hematologically transmissible. I personally think it's likely. Second, um, the uh, recent uh, uh, donors were or donations were removed from the pool where somebody went COVID positive within two weeks of that donation, um, and 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 therefore, um, as far as we know, we we had removed the um, the likely positive donations from the pool, and we didn't have any reports of transmission. Um, reported to us or likely transmissions reported to us but we were absolutely on the watch out for that because we thought yeah this could be the last time we looked at something like this this was around uh, new variant cjd so yes we're, we're we're very interested in this what would we do if we suddenly did start getting reports through of something where we had no idea what it was but there was clearly a pattern of illness evolving in people who had been transfused, we didn't yet have uh, an organism um, identified. And I think that's probably closer to the question you were asking. What I hope we would be able to do is identify a pattern and identify a pattern early on. Now, that would be much easier with a national transfusion database where complex statistical techniques could be applied, neural networks, artificial intelligence, and so on. But even as we stand at the moment, we would hope to be able to, where there was a suspicion of what the threat might be, identify it and manage it as we did with COVID. But if we simply started observing patterns, I would hope that we would be in a position to recognize those patterns re relatively early and at least ask the question, um, is this infection related? Now, I'm not sure that the reporting system as it exists at the moment is either sufficiently sophisticated or sufficiently robust for people to identify in their own hospitals one-offs of mystery illnesses and report them as potentially transfusion transmissible. Um, I may have to bounce this one back to Professor Newberger because, again, probably the, the, the nearest um, similar public health um, query that arose was around childhood hepatitis mm -hmm. recently. Um, and, and, and that's, a, a, in a way, is a very similar question. Professor Newberger, we could then turn to you on that. It's a killer question, really. Um, I think a lot depends on the nature of the infection, both microbiologically, if you like, it's natural, but also it's natural history. And with COVID, for example, which came up unexpectedly, or I mean, people were predicting there'd be a, 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 a some sort of uh, respiratory viral outbreak. They were, didn't know of what and when. Um, there was a very fast response through JPAC, through the UK blood services. SABTO is not set up or capable of dealing with rapid responses. 
um, JPAC came to it very quickly and put in place measures to mitigate that risk. SABTO's role was to make sure that those measures were in place and thank uh, uh, JPAC and the blood services for doing that. But um, so when an acute infection like that comes along, I think people mm -hmm. respond promptly and put in measures in place to deferring donors and as serological tests become available, consider whether those should be introduced or not. A lot depends on whether you think it can be transmitted by blood because not uh, our, our three lines of defense are primarily donor selection and we know that's pretty accurate but inevitably not 100%. There's treatment of the blood with leukodepletion and sometimes other measures and then there's testing of the blood for a limited range of, uh, which I'm sure you'll come on to uh, uh, later on. I think the worry that I have is whether they're, when the new agents that are being detected, and I think one of my worries with new generation sequencing, which is basically taking these highly sophisticated molecular techniques that I think will identify new agents. And we will have the challenge of knowing whether they're potentially infectious, whether they're transmissible, what the impact is on the recipients. And I think we're going, my worry, and this is entirely uh, based on prejudice rather than fact, is, is my worry is that we're going to be identifying a lot of potential infectious <coughs> agents. And we're going to have to work quite quickly um, to try and identify those that are of relevance mm -hmm. um, and protect the blood supply. Um, so technology has advanced tremendously and as we've seen with indeed with H, you know, hepatitis C is now for nearly everybody curable <laughs> once it's been diagnosed. Um, but technologies for diagnosis are getting a huge deal better. Um, treatments are getting better. And, pe and as we saw with COVID, you can introduce new technologies, new treatments very, very quickly if there's a will to do so. Um, so it is a worry. We can be alert. Again, it, it, it <laughs> Managing Hep B, C, <coughs> HIV, HEV, and so on, to my mind, is a lot easier than managing the unknowns. And they're the ones that I worry about and what we can do about it other than be vigilant. Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer to. Epidemiology may help, but if you think the residual risk for, say, currently hepatitis B is, what, less than four per million donations, it's going to be very difficult to do epidemiological studies to pick up signals mm. if the risk is that low. Mm. So I think I don't have a solution, and all we can do, I think, at best is to be very vigilant, be critical, watch technologies, learn from other countries, uh, um, but it does remain to me a very significant risk that SABTO has to be aware of but at the moment, because it's the, by nature, it's the unknown unknowns, uh, uh, that's a rather feeble answer, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, Dr. Cave, if I... Uh, I'm sort of not a feeble answer, but Dr. <laughs> Cave, if I, if I could ask you, yeah. um, how, how robust do you think our system of, of vigilance is for those unknown unknowns? So I think, again, you know, re reflecting what peop uh, my... Colleagues sitting here, other witnesses have said it, it kind of depends on the scale of the risk and what the reaction would be. So um, if it was thought to be a scenario where it would transmit a deadly disease potentially through a blood product, I think we would all agree we would act very proactively to remove, for example, if it was a blood product, to remove that product from the market. We, for example, at MHRA would try and understand where the virus or, what, or the infection had entered the supply chain. And I think that would be the same 
were a blood or a blood component. At what point do we think that it had entered the supply chain? So, for example, if it was a blood product, which is, of course, a more global manufacturing chain, uh, a sort of scenario, the first thing we would do is alert other regulatory authorities to understand whether they are seeing a similar scenario or not. We would then look to quarantine that particular, if it was a if it was a plasma-based product, to quarantine the plasma that it was derived from, to take batches off the market, to understand, so, so we remove the risk if that was a possibility. We would inspect the manufacturing facilities to understand if that was the point at which uh, a, a, a virus, the contamination had occurred. Um, and we could also go back and look at batches of the plasma to retest, to understand had the virus not been detected, if it was an unknown virus, and as Professor Bellamy was discussing, you know, increasingly there are options for more ag sort of agnostic diagnostic techniques where you don't need to potentially um, have a knowledge of the, the viral contaminant that you're looking at, and increasingly that might be approaches, particularly where you have a specific concern where you want to sort of interrogate a problem that you have had. I would just like to say there is sort of no conceivable scenario where if it was a deadly infection or, or a really severe risk that that product would, would remain on the market. Um, and communication, sorry, would be a vital part of that action. Another aspect, and again drawing on evidence of the inquiry, has heard. In those circumstances, would you expect the involvement of the wider scientific, academic and medical community? Or would it be left to a, a, a group of key advisors to the, uh, to the Department of Health or similar body? I'll turn to you first of all, Dr Cave. So for us, we would of course seek the advice of our expert working groups and the Commission on Human Medicines. Um, in certain circumstances, we will set up expert working groups on specific topics of concern and this would seem to be this sort of thing would seem to warrant that sort of approach where we draw together experts to who have specific expertise that we're seeking um, to interrogate or to advise us on a particular topic and we would then supply the materials the data and they would advise us on the appropriate regulatory action would you seek to try to make as much of that data public as, as possible to allow outsiders to, to see it as well. Yeah, and increasingly we um, are doing exactly that. Um, I could point to a, to a safety issue we've currently um, had where we ran a consultation. We had open sessions where we sought the views of um, patients and their carers and their families and also had open sessions of the Commission on Human Medicines um, and ultimately we'll be publishing a, a, a public report on that. Professor um, Neuberger, and then I'll turn to you, Professor Bellamy, on, on this point. How well does the, the UK as a whole harness the expertise it has in its medical institutions and its uh, academies, in addition to those who are, are sitting on the, the kind of committees that you sit on? I, I think on the whole, again, it depends on the situation, but we do work extremely well with our colleagues. We have different roles, different responsibilities, but the goal is always the same. And we, we do work together. I think sometimes, uh, um, from my point of view, it's frustratingly slow. But again, we've seen as with COVID, again, when pe there is a real emergency, people get together and, can and do work very fast. We do collaborate, we do talk to each other. I know that may reflect on the independence, I suppose, but. Uh, um, there has to be collaboration and bringing in outside and publication and transparency. And again, that was very much an effect of the early COVID days. And my colleagues in, uh, uh, working on COVID now told me that international collaboration is sadly waning. Um, but um, it's really important. And that's where the people on SABTO all have their own local networks and they will bring them in as and when necessary, because as I say, everybody's got the same goal in mind, which is ultimately patient safety. Professor Bellamy, same question to you about the, the way in which 
the UK draws on its wider expertise. Yeah, and a very similar answer to Professor Newberg is really, it depends a lot on the context, um, but the greater the threat, the greater the momentum, both in the scientific community, and by that I'd, I'd include not just the university sector, but also um, industry-based research. Um, so the greater the threat, the greater the momentum in those areas, the more information we have to draw on, the more that's published and published rapidly, um, and uh, the, the, the wider the group of experts we can draw on. And also, our processes speed up as well. So for example, through COVID, um, our <coughs> meetings and uh, subgroup and working group meetings um, became uh, much more frequent, albeit as online meetings, and that was a new departure for us as well. But it did mean that, w that we could handle information and ask appropriate questions much more quickly than, than we had traditionally in what you might call peacetime. I'm going to add one sorry, point here, yes, because I would just, I think COVID is a very good example, but I just wanted to pick up the data piece there because we did collaborate very widely in terms of data sources and in terms of international regulators. And, and the reason it's quite relevant to your scenario is because the, the vaccines were being deployed at different stages to different populations at different times, that sharing of the information allowed us to see risks as they emerged because of a different deployment strategy or a, a vaccination program. So I think in terms of the example that you're discussing, that would be a relevant scenario. In some of the evidence that the inquiry has heard, uh, going back to the 1980s, there's this issue about the, the length of time mm. that reports mm. take physically to yeah. cross from one country to another. Um, Nowadays, uh, uh, it's digital imagine. now. You know, almost all of our reports are digital. I think in the 1980s, they would have been written yellow cards that come by post. Um, and you can imagine in an international scenario, that would have slowed down communication of information. But now everything is digitized. The WHO has a massive database as well. So there is, it is easier now to, and to share. And of course, manufacturing authorization holders are obliged to report an adverse event wherever it happens in the world with their product if it's on the UK market. And to make that report immediately? Or? There's, there is certain time scales depending on the severity of the report that are set down in the legislation. Um, I'm going to move, um, uh, I note the time, so it'll be rather rapid through some of the other weaknesses that have been identified in the system. Um, we have your statements, and we'll be able to take many of them from there. But just to, to pick up a, a couple of them. Um, firstly, a, a point which has come up repeatedly, and perhaps to avoid false modesty, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Cave this. How important to the system of hemovigilance in this country is the fact that Professor Bellamy, Professor Neuberger, are willing to voluntarily give of their time to chair the committees that they do? I mean, incredibly important and we have the same situation with our independent experts on all of our working groups who give up their time which can be considerable to support us in defining and understanding the best risk mitigation measures that are available to us. You know, having that clinical insight, the understanding of how the product is used in clinical practice, the performance of it and some of those risks and communication challenges that are in the healthcare system is incredibly important for us as we design our risk mitigation measures. It follows from your answer, but it is a solution is not to make the whole thing professional and full time because you need the experts who are out. You need there. to be people who are using the products. Yeah, uh, Professor Neuberg, in Neuberger, sorry, in, in your statement, <laughs> you um, I knew I would at one stage, <laughs> Professor Neuberger, uh, in your statement, um, you express some concerns about the amount of time that is being allowed for people like you to, to participate in those kind of roles by their institutions and their hospitals. Yeah, yes, I, I just should say, firstly, I don't care what you call me. I've been called <laughs> many more things. So, uh, uh, um, it, it's just some of my brothers are new and some of my brothers are Neuberger. We have to, the Oxford ones for Newberger, the Cambridge ones, 
Heiberger. For <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, uh, you can see their judgment is flawed. Um, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, no, it, uh, and, and for me now, I, I'm really, as I said, retired from clinical practice, so I have a lot more time. But we are finding for recruitment um, that many people who would like to join SABTO and would be very good members, they're le world leaders, scientists, clinicians, um, they don't have the time to devote to it, they, and existing members even are being pressured by their organizations, be it university or NHS, that this is not what they're paid for, this is not delivering the hospital or university targets, and they're under, some have actually resigned because of they have come under pressure. And I think it, as, as, as Dr. Kay says, it's absolutely essential to have people who have, yes, you need people in the organization, you need the scientists, you need the pharmacists, you need the medics and so on, the managers in the organization, but you need people who are out there who understand the situation. There's no point in making recommendations that are impractical. Um, and, and so I do think that people's contribution needs to be recognized. And one way, perhaps, I, I know that professional bodies, and I think even the Departments of Health, have written to chief execs making that point that it that having their s staff, medical, surgical, health professionals contributing to the national effort improves patient care in their hospital of itself. Um, when push comes to shove, the pressures are there, we need you to do the clinic, we need you to manage the lab, whatever it is. And um, so I don't think cajoling works. I think <coughs> remuneration and personally, I'd prefer a remuneration of the organization rather than the individual um, so that um, uh, 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 um, the person who, and particularly for our working parties, they take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and people need to have the right to, to say, look, I'm doing this, this is proper time. And also it helps me because I can say, look, you're paid to do this, and I expect you to deliver, whereas if they're doing it pro bono, as it were, inevitably that's going to take second place to the immediate pressures. Um, so I do think there needs to be a proper resourcing of these organizations. Again, we have no defined administra administrative support. We have good support, but all the th three or four people working, supporting any, uh, SABTO have other commitments. And, they, and again, the urgent often takes precedence over the importance so I think they do need to be properly resourced, um, both in terms of admin support and encouraging the right, the leaders who we have and also the upcoming leaders to be able to contribute uh, uh, um, to this. Um, I, I, one argument was put to me, but there are merit awards or whatever they're called now, and I think that's a false argument. Um, Firstly, they're not available to scientists. They're not available to all clinicians across the UK. And most of the people who are on SEPTO, I suspect, have A-plus or platinum merit awards anyway. So there's no gain for them. It's just aggro and less time seeing their family. But they do it because I think, like everybody here, again, they have a common goal. When you talk of remuneration, um, is the suggestion of some form of central fund, perhaps from the Department of Health and Social Care, which would be directed towards institutions who were prepared to allow their employees to come and, and work on such committees? Yes, I mean, except I, I, I would rephrase that, that the employer should be expected to allow rather than there's an uh, expectation that you will do it, and when you do it, you will receive this remuneration so that you can provide a, a consultant for the, the clinic that that consultant is missing. Yes, yeah. Um, Professor Bellamy, could I um, ask the same question of, of you and your experience at Short? Uh, my experience is very similar to Professor Newberger's, and for brevity, I will offer exactly the same answer as his. Um, 
turning to um, the question of the Professor Newberger raised earlier, um, the costs of marginal gains in, in safety. Uh, there is a, an example, which I, I won't go through in detail now, but helpfully set out in your statement and in the attachments to your statements, and indeed the public minutes which uh, SABTO publish, of hepatitis E uh, and decisions taken as to how hepatitis E testing should progress. Uh, I won't go through the detail. We can turn to it if we need to. Um, but could you explain the, the position that has been reached thus far by SABTO on, on what hepatitis, what recommendations should be made about hepatitis C testing? Robert? Right, if, if I can just give a little bit of context. I'll of course. Brief. Um, hepatitis C is a hepatitis virus that there are various forms, but the ones we're concerned about is genotype 3 or 4, which is spread primarily by food um, and mainly pork, deer and venison. Um, and it has come into the UK over the last few years. Um, hepatitis C infection for healthy people is usually a very mild self-limiting illness, but for certain groups of people it can be severe and it indeed be fatal. So people particularly who are immunosuppressed um, were, uh, for whatever reason and get blood transfusions such as organ transplant recipients, um, they will go on to get a chronic infection, often subclinical, so they feel relatively well until they develop cirrhosis or end-stage liver failure people who have cirrhosis again who get a super added hepatitis E uh, um, infection from a transfusion say from a bleed from a variceal bleed again it can tip them into liver failure so we were one of the first countries in the world to introduce hepatitis E testing and I think over two or three years from my memory about 200 and something 40 um, donations were identified by testing um, and the plan was when we recommended that and it was implemented that we would review it after two years. We did that. Um, now hitherto the testing was done in pools, that's to say small amounts of plasma I think, I may be wrong on this, small amounts of blood were taken from individual donors, pooled and then tested. And then if those pools were found positive, then uh, 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 um, the individual ones would be isolated. The reasons for pooling is, is primarily one of economy. Uh, obviously, you're doing a 24th or 16th of the number of tests, and therefore your costs go down in proportion. Um, we did further analysis and we found that we could reduce the risk even further but if you but if you did individual testing by uh, NAP nuclear uh, nucleic acid testing but when we looked at the benefit of that and then it worked out at approximately 800,000 pounds per quality now I think Again, one of the difficult challenges that, again, we're starting to discuss within SABTO is how far financial risk benefit should impact on decisions. Now, SABTO is in a very luxuriant position in that we make recommendations. We're not responsible for their acceptance or implementation. That's up to ministers, which is a great luxury for us. But clearly, we've got to be fiscally responsible. S NICE uses, and, 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 and the Green Book of the Department of Health, which is adopted, I think, by Wales, but Scotland has a slightly similar, uh, a, a slightly different approach, uh, uses, as you know, thresholds for about 30,000 per, quali per quality adjusted life year for most of their interventions, whether they approve or not. For some, it can be higher and indeed up to 300,000 per quality, but that's an order of magnitude less than 800,000 pounds per quality. 
I have no doubt in my own mind, and we need to argue this publicly and discuss it, that blood is in a very different situation from, say, paracetamol in terms of cost per quality, and the threshold should be very different. But, of course, it's all coming out of one budget and money that goes into making the blood supply safer will mean less somewhere else. And thank goodness I don't have to make those decisions. Um, so we did discuss this, and we advised ministers um, that, yes, it could be done, we could reduce the risks further, but we felt the price was high. <coughs> Clearly, that decision, thank goodness, was not ours. Um, I do think we need to do more work on thresholds as a public consultation. The decision's clearly not ours. Um, and it's caused a lot of discussion and uh, robust debate within SABTO. Uh, um, but uh, hopefully we'll work towards some uh, outcome. And so that's the scenario that we have is that at what, how, how much are the public prepared to pay further to improve blood safety? And that's not for SABT to make. Let me make it very clear. We can help, we can work with health economists to do the maths, but I think that's a very much a public decision um, by accountable individuals. The decision's gone to ministers, but I suspect the boxes are chasing around at the moment, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and I'm not sure what the outcome is yet. Uh, and just so we are clear, although the advice has been given to ministers, the discussions that SABTO have been having on this issue, the, the detail of those discussions, has been published online yes. it, through your minutes. So it is, it, this is not being done uh, behind closed doors. The, the public <coughs> and clinicians can understand what those discussions are and, if necessary, comment upon them. I think it's very important that we are transparent and we are public. This is not for us to make the decision. This is a very wide... And, and the interest with the IBI and previous inquiries emphasises, I think, the strong importance of this question. And it's not for a small committee of even independently appointed experts to judge. Uh, and just for the transcript, um, quality, Q-A-L-Y, is a, a measure of quality of life yes. uh, per year uh, uh, adjusted. So, so when you're thinking of health interventions, you think of, broadly speaking, two components. One is the length of the, the increase in life years you get from that intervention, but also the quality of that life. And that quality of life is assessed primarily using a patient-reported outcome. So it's not the clinician saying, I think your life's good or your life's bad. It's patients who fill in a usually something called the e EQD5, your equal, there are other instruments that can be used, but a measure of the quality of life. So one year of top quality is equivalent to two years of half quality, if you will. It, 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 it's a course metric but it means you can compare the benefits from, say, a hip replacement to a liver transplant to, um, I don't know, uh, any other, uh, um, to any other intervention you care to mention. Um, but it provides a common me measure. It has its limitations, and it has to be used, I think, fairly um, <coughs> sensibly. Uh, but it's one way of, I think, equitable distribution of a limited resource. Uh, having garbled the acronym, I'll just correct sorry. it. Quality ad adjusted life, life years. years. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Um, Long-winded answer. No, no, no. Sorry. Thank you very much for it. Um, I'm conscious of the time, sir. Um, as I say, there are other weaknesses which have been identified uh, in the, the reports of the uh, the experts we have before us. Um, before I conclude my questioning, uh, I, I would like to give each of them an opportunity to just identify anything else that they particularly wish to bring to your attention as, as weaknesses in the system. Um, 
conscious of the fact that they have also spoken about the strengths and the overall robustness of it as well. If I could turn to you, uh, Professor Bellamy. Um, yes, the, the one that exercises me the most is the, um, the, the freedom and the robustness of the reporting service. And without wishing to speak at great length, I would point people towards the um, 2019 Laboratory Culture Survey, uh, which looked at the sorts of um, concerns and issues experienced by transfusion laboratory staff when reporting concerns uh, to, to shot. Uh, and those references are contained in your, in your statement. They are. The, the um, survey itself is attached to it. Uh, you referred to it earlier as well, I think, when you were I did. talking about the, uh, the concerns that uh, reporting was nuanced to make the institution look better. To, in some cases, yes, and other reporters who felt um, whether it was their own perception or whether it was real felt in some way intimidated uh, and less able to make the report they would have liked to have done. Uh, and... There is no immediately identifiable solution to that, but is that where cultural change is? Uh, this, this, is this is all around cultural change. It's all around uh, human factors where it's not about pointing at the individual who was closest to the disaster when it happened. But um, to take an example from um, a guy called David Newman, who's an aviation safety expert, air accident investigator, the question he asks is, if you had removed those two pilots on that day and substituted <coughs> two others, or you had retrained them, could that, were the other errors in the system sufficient that that accident could still have happened, either on that day or another day? And Human Factors is all about applying that sort of approach to, in transfusion to transfusion medicine. So it's, what are all those other little system things that all gradually stack up it might be a management decision, it might be understaffing, it might be lack of a piece of kit, it might be software that hasn't been updated, and line them all up together, and sooner or later, somebody will make an accident which previously might have had no impact, but now because all of the other holes in the cheese are in place, suddenly um, is no longer a near miss. Uh, I would also um, refer the chair and others who are interested to the introduction to the the most recent shot report, which considers some of those themes. Um, the reference is uh, SHOT uh, 5032, the report that we looked at earlier. Um, Professor uh, Newberger, if I could turn to you with the same question. I, I'm just make a couple of comments. I, I, I think just having to complete the witness statement gave me a lot of questions for thought and some changes already we're starting to introduce. So I think in itself it's been a very productive thing. And as you say, we shouldn't over-egg the problems in the system. I think on the whole the blood system is still safe and robust and patients in the UK are well served. But that's not complacency. I think there's still a lot of... The one thing I think we haven't discussed, the weakness, is the complexity of the hemovigilance system. I think there is some duplication there's some overlap, as I say, overlap and duplicate, I'm doing myself. Um, and I think there are a lot of interactions between a lot of in expert groups. I do think there is some potential in reviewing the whole hemovigilance system, seeing if it can be simplified. I think there's potential for the role of SABTO to change. Um, and given the expertise of organizations such as JPAC, which is the uh, forum funded by the four UK blood health services. Um, so I, I think there's a potential benefit in reviewing how hemovigilance is done in the light of what we've learned. Um, and I think it could be improved and strengthened and made more streamlined and efficient. Uh, just for the transcript, um, uh, Professor Newberger very helpfully provided an organogram which shows many of these organisations and the way they interact with each other. I won't bring it up now, but the references are lit 
301855. Um, Dr Cave, um, turning to you, you uh, section 9 of your witness statement, you set out uh, strengths and weaknesses, and mm. the chair and everybody else will have an opportunity yep. to, to read that. Uh, could I ask the same question of you as to, to whether uh, anything in particular that you feel needs to be highlighted? I think I would just highlight again and maybe expand a little bit on the facil facilitation of the reporting. I do believe the simpler you make it and the easier you make it, that facilitates reporting. I think probably Dame June Rain talked a little bit about our new system. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that are coming in which could be implemented within, which will be actually and could be implemented within the, pharma, the HEMA vigilance as well as the pharma, pharmaca vigilance, which is about conditional logic. So when a person comes in and reports a particular issue, they get asked a series of questions that we already know we want to ask them. So that might save time in terms of going back to the reporter, facilitate a more rapid response. We are using much more artificial intelligence, machine learning, to try and integrate our data better to understand where we might see heat spots that we wouldn't expect, use word clouds to bring out narratives to try and interrogate the system in, in new and novel ways to save on that manual interrogation of data. I think just reflecting on some of the things that have come out in the discussion, I think allowing or enabling patients better to report re, uh, reactions to blood and blood components could be something we could implement through the yellow card scheme and have a better reporting system to that. We find that patient reports are incredibly valuable to us. They bring different perspective and different reactions to us and are really, really helpful. And I think aligned with that, they also allow us to communicate as well. So within our new Safety Connect system, reporters can follow particular products, which allows us then to feed back particular risk communications we might want to. It also allows us to potentially feed back the impact of that report, which again, I think in the discussions today might promote reporting because if you can see that something you've reported has actually had an impact and resulted in an action that actually promotes reporting. I think the only other thing I would bring out is in terms of more pharmacovigilance, when we're trying to understand the biological mechanism of an adverse drug reaction, that's something that we're working hard on to try and put in place measures to better understand the biological mechanism. Is there a biomarker? Is there something that we can track and follow to enable us to have better and more targeted risk mitigation measures? But other than that, you can read within my statement some further thoughts. I'm very grateful. Um, so those are the, the questions that I have. There will be questions from core participants. I say that confidently, not least because um, some have been very helpfully provided to me already. Um, and I suggest a, a break now to, to allow for those. Uh, yes. Well, well, we'll take a break, and, uh, not, and we will come back not before quarter past four. The reason I say not before is council must have time to field questions which will be um, put to him to ask you from those who, who uh, are, represent the various different interests in the inquiry, they have a right to put questions through counsel to any witness, um, but plainly they can't necessarily formulate those questions until they've heard all the evidence. Some uh, they will have done already, as counsel has indicated as he's gone along, others wait to be asked. Um, so we may need more time, um, in which case you'll be told, but otherwise, we'll come back at quarter past four, um, and I can't tell you how long you'll be detained uh, after that. Not before quarter past four. <laughs>